and I'm Kathy Foley Meyer. I'm a candidate uh, for the PhD in visual studies. I'm also a visual artist. Um, I work in mixed media. The relationship between the ocean and blackness is my focus. Themes of transparency and obviously identity and yeah. So my name is yeah. Patrick Rafter. I'm a, a research scientist at UC Irvine's Department of Earth System Science. I generally introduce myself as someone who studies uh, the ocean and climate. And what I mean by that is that the ocean actually plays a, an important role in setting both local and global climate. And I, I work on a variety of timescales, um, timescales from hundreds of thousands of years to just the seasons. The Ocean Memory Project started uh, one to two years before we met, and it's the outcome of a um, National Academies of Sciences um, related workshop to foster uh, collaboration between artists and scientists. They wrote a proposal to have to sort of explore the idea of ocean memory and whatever that means. So explore it through art and explore it through science. And, but, you know, in addition to that, to bring together artists and scientists to continue to inspire each other and explore this idea of the ocean, ocean memory. What is ocean memory or what about ocean memory? And um, so I've been involved um, since the beginning and organized a few of these events myself, these workshops where the artists and scientists come together and there's sort of an undercurrent of what is ocean memory? What does this mean to you? And what does this phrase inspire in you? For me, I cannot think about the ocean and not, like if the ocean has memory, for me, that memory has to also contain memory of the Middle Passage. Uh, you know, the Black people that did not make it through the Middle Passage that were um, cast into the sea during the course of a voyage um, uh, during the slave trade and uh, the diaspora and, you know, the millions of uh, Black bodies that are existing in residence time, like right now in the ocean. Because I, I was just thinking about the ocean as a container of memory, as a place of transition, as like a, a womb, a, you know, a site of birth, a site of rebirth, all that stuff. And then I was thinking about it in conjunction with Blackness having to kind of occupy all these different positions in order to survive. And so I Googled it and then the Ocean Memory Project came up and I was like, oh. It's, uh, yeah, so by watching and listening to Kathy um, talk about the Middle Passage and the unbelievable loss of life in the ocean, um, or in these uh, talks you were giving, these presentations, you used oceanographic terms like residence time and what you were mentioning spoke to my research, which is understanding how elements move in and out of the ocean. And so my, I immediately thought, well, we can use a, you know, a computer model that I, that I used to study how these elements move in the ocean we can use the, the data for the um, slave trade that you showed us. Showed, I, I had no idea this existed. And um, it was just unbelievable that it exists because it's, I think you described it as, um, of course this, this data exists because it was like accounting, because it was like uh, inventory, it was like a business. And it's just it's such a, like a disgusting thought but I thought, you know, we have, we have this data and we have these tools to actually simulate where, um, uh, I think I titled the proposal, where are they now? You know, where we can see exactly where in the ocean they are because this computer model um, has the best simulation of ocean circulation and we can put within it equations that simulate the breakdown of a body and where the elements go and how they move um, and, uh, and the different reactions of this, these elements. 
and, and then actually see where they move in the global ocean. And so I, I feel like this is a really, um, this would be a really interesting, um, useful project. That was my question to the Ocean Memory Project. Where are they? How, literally, where are they now? So slavevoyages.org is the database that Patrick was referring to and that I've been using as an inspiration for my artwork. And it is, as he says, it's this accounting of the trade, but it's also obviously so much more than that. So your project, that's where you would answer so many questions when then of course there would be questions that can never be answered. Um, but it's something I think about every time I look at those maps of you know, the currents and there are all these sort of layers of currents in the ocean as well. So your model presumably could account for that, for the dispersal of human beings. Mm -hmm. And obviously we don't know exactly when during the voyage um, bodies were deposited, but I think your model, yeah, that's that would be an amazing uh, and fruitful uh, modeling uh, that could happen, and it's you know inspire even more art and uh, science. Hopefully, it's a surprisingly meaningful use of our skills that, um, like, I never would have thought I'd be able to do, right? Um, like I study ocean and climate. That's nice. That's good. Um, and it, But I never thought I'd ever be able to apply these skills to something um, that's very timely, right? So this is, um, it's just, and I, and I wouldn't have gotten there without you, Kathy. So thanks. No. And it, I should say it's our project, right? So no, we're all no, working it's, on it. No, that's Cool. And I was just going to say, there's a movement afoot via an international mining authority to recognize on virtual maps this dispersal of life across the ocean. So I, I guess there are um, these mining maps that exist, and they and there there's a sort of a movement in in academia to get the loss of African life recognized on the maps that are used. So it would be like a virtual marker of where these this loss of life took place. So I feel like, you know, it's in the ether, the idea that we have to, you know, account somehow for this loss of life and remember it. And um, because those people are also our ancestors, it's not just the ones that made it across. And so, yeah, we have to recognize those who did not um, make the journey. Um, well, I think the artistic process and the scientific process are so similar in that you have an idea, you have to come up with a way to explore the idea. So um, if you're a scientist, you design your experiments, um, you, you have your materials, and if you're an artist, it's kind of the same thing. And then, and then the process is, a, typically it's a series of failures. So if you're, um, <laughs> you know, say if you're a scientist who's trying to, you know, bring a drug to market, you know, you're going to have a series of times when it doesn't work. And then with art, sometimes it's the same way. You, you make this stuff and you're like, oh, I remember the first time I did my individual voyage paintings, which I've decided to do more of. Um, but the first one just had like, kind of random numbers and they didn't, I was mainly doing what a color test and I wanted to see what the colors, how they worked on this particular type of paper, this very heavy paper that looks like the surface of the ocean. Um, and it's paper that, you know, a lot of things are happy accidents. So this is paper that another artist who used my studio for a long time left and said, oh, I don't need this paper anymore. And then I thought, oh, this paper is wonderful really heavy and it looks like the surface of the ocean and it absorbs color really well. So sometimes your accidents are successful, you know, you're, you stop failing and it becomes this thing and you're like, okay, it's done for now. Um, and then sometimes it takes you in a completely different direction, but the two processes are so similar. And I think that's why the collaboration between art and science works so well.
sometimes I feel guilty about doing these art science collaborations because it's, I'm, there's so much like selfish motivation on, on my part because I'm really hoping for some inspiration to solving you know, questions about global climate that I, I would love to answer some of these questions. And if, and I don't know where that inspiration comes from for, you know, these um, hypotheses, right? These potential answers that I then have to test. So after, you know, uh, 10 years or so of being a, a professional scientist, um, why not join up with artists and, and explore some of this climate data, which is um, one of the projects I'm working with uh, Kathy on um, in a visual way or in whatever way you, you want to look at this data. But the data is um, global climate over the last 60 million years. So it's, it's essentially the most recent state of planet Earth and how climate has changed over that time period. And um, so there are a lot of questions sort of within that data set that would be really interesting to have answers to. <laughs> and you never, you never know where the answers are gonna come from. So uh, why not um, team up with some cool artists and make some cool things? Uh, and at least at the end, of, even if we don't have uh, new answers to um, global climate change, um, we'll have some cool pieces of art. Patrick has these really beautiful renditions of climate change. They're very attractive um, temperature scales in these beautiful colors. So um, I'm trying to print them in a certain way that I can use them in this piece that I'm doing. I'm going to add this, this brilliant sort of color time scale to um, a piece that I'm working on right now. Yeah, and I am um, actually, Kathy suggested um, using 3D printing and looking at the data in different angles by having an actual physical object to look at. There are all different reasons to collaborate and I would say um, both of these areas can borrow from, you know, art can borrow from science and science can borrow from art in terms of methodology and ways of thinking and ways of problem solving and perhaps uh, art helps science, the science of climate change be more readily accepted or, you know, we're still having the argument in some corners about, you know, whether climate change is actually happening. So maybe art can help, uh, you know, bridge that gap. So collaborations like this are a way to just tackle the problem from all these different angles together and also have um, awareness of it spread through all these other disciplines. But I think it's a way to keep all of these schools of knowledge and containers um, healthy and invigorated and not stale. And um, it's part of the diversity it's like literally a diversity of thought, a diversity of field. It's just fun to constantly like to constantly be inspired and chase down new ideas. And I mean, I've had so many ideas because of this art science collaboration um, over the years. I, you know, for one of them was to build a skate park that was based on climate data, so that you could actually skate the data <laughs> and that was that was literally me um walking around with some artists and they they mentioned this one sculpture just because it was a cool sculpture it was uh they call it art brut it's a french artist but he made these giant like parks that were sculptures you could walk around in and i was thinking instead of the sculpture just being from the mind of an artist, it could be the data that, you know, and then I could skate my data. It's just been really fun working with artists uh, because we can do things outside of the lab and potentially have these kind of big impacts. So um, on a variety of different projects.
So um, yeah, it's been really fun. You know, just, I feel really lucky to be able to Likewise. collaborate with these smart artists. <laughs>